Welcome to Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life and people chatting it up on the way into worship. Now that is a good thing. This is a beloved community striving to live its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, or spirit, and adding to the healing of the world. We are unapologetically progressive in welcoming people of all ethnicities and races, sexual orientation and gender identities, social economic abilities and situations, and all the abilities. We advocate for human rights, and we strive to be good stewards of this earth. So in living our mission, we recognize the network of relationships of which we are a part. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They and other nations were here long before the first European settlers came down to Illinois River. We honor the Peoria people in worship. Every time we gather, we honor them for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank everybody for joining us in person and online. One of the powerful lessons of the last few years is how precious it is to come together, to be with other people, to expand our circles of care, to expand our circles of kindness and compassion. So if you are new to us, uh, please help us get to know you. We have an abundance of name tags. We have some extra stickers, too, if you want to add your pronouns to your name tags as well. Uh, everybody's welcome to join and visit after the service. We'll be gathering in Fellowship Hall for coffee if you're with us in person. We're also on Zoom if you're joining us electronically. And I also want to encourage, as we're on the way out of the sanctuary today, please be sure to turn and greet someone, someone who might be new, someone you don't know. It's so powerful to introduce ourselves to one another. I also want to invite you at this point to turn your devices to worship mode, uh, whether that is vibrate or silent. And, and I tell I always need that reminder myself. Uh, we have a couple of notes for today. One, after the service at noon in the conference room, we have coffee with the minister. This is a great way to uh, Come and get to know some other people, but also come and ask any questions you want of me about uh, me, the church, Unitarian Universalism, and so on. This is a great way to kind of get to know a little bit more. Um, and you can see Regina Stanley, who are our membership coordinator. Regina, you're yep, waving, the, waving the hand in here for any questions as well. So get a coffee, get a snack, and come join us in the conference room. Just you, in case you hadn't been in the kitchen yet, I hear there's pumpkin pie. I know, I know. There you go. I'm looking forward to some as well. All right. Uh, we have a special note for next Sunday. Uh, next Sunday after the service at 2 p.m., uh, we will have the drag story time. U unicorns in the UU church. I mean, who doesn't want to come and hang out with a unicorn? I mean, come on. So, I want to invite everybody to join us, bring family, friends. This is an all-ages event uh, with performer Juju Holiday. And I ask, please, um, RSVP, if you can, we want to make sure we have enough supplies for everybody. I think, I think that is all the notes we have for this morning. I want to invite you to rise and body your spirit with me and join us for our opening hymn number 40, The Morning Hangs a Signal.
Please be seated. And I invite Reverend Patrick Price to offer our opening words. We gather as a house of stories, as a shelter shot with memories that speak, that long for us to listen, without which we easily lose our way. As we learn of those who have gone before, the way in front becomes more clear. As we remember what they survived and what they sacrificed for the faceless of us who would come after, we find courage far beyond what we could muster on our own. Beneath this seemingly worn out world, there are wells from which we can drink. Come, let our thirst guide us there. Come, let those sweet ghosts whisper their gifts. I want to invite Benny and Penn Keister for our chalice lighting. Come together, ah. Come gather light to build by Kai Kai Lee Bordner. Come together again, gather in love, light the fire of hope build the foundation. Come together again, gather in truth, light the fire of freedom, build entryways. Continue together again, gather in community, light the fire of the future, build the shelter. but we thought we'd offer the lyrics if you'd like to also know what they're singing. In 
James Villa Blake reminds us that love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. In that spirit, I invite us into meditation. I invite us into quiet, and I invite us this is our time for the lighting of candles during our music for meditation. This is the moment of bringing a little light to something that is in our minds and on our hearts. You're welcome to come. I will light the candles on the table, and then you're welcome to come forward and light candles of your own. So now let us enter into our time for meditation.
spirit of community in which we find strength and common purpose. We turn our minds and hearts toward one another, seeking to bring into our circle of concern all who need our love and support. Those who are ill, those who are in pain, either in body or spirit, those who are lonely, those who are in need of healing. And we bring into our care all people in all seasons of life, people remembering, people celebrating, people honoring and cherishing. We offer wishes for health to Jill Thomas as she recovers from surgery. I just received a note from her this morning. She's still in the hospital and getting stronger. We also offer our love and care to her granddaughters, Jordan and Michaela. Uh, they are doing a great job of supporting Jill in her recovery. We turn to sympathy. We offer our sympathy to Ann Kamiski on the death of her mother this week. We also offer sympathy to the family and friends of Ron Love, who is a member of the congregation. Uh, Ron, we saw, died on Friday. His obituary is online. Um, he was more, a more recent member. He joined the congregation in 2016. Um, as you'll see in the obituary, his celebration will be on Wednesday uh, in Bradley Park. We also offer our sympathy to the family and friends of George Hopkins. Uh, George died on September 28th. He and his wife Elaine had been long uh, members in the past. Uh, something notable uh, that Pat Harris uh, pointed out to me is that uh, George was a very well-respected professor at Western Illinois University. In fact, he received Teacher of the Year in 1979. We offer our sympathy to all who knew and loved George. Now I invite us into one more moment of quiet, to be present to all the joys, the sorrows, the names, the milestones that are among us, and remain unspoken. We pause this moment and breathe. Amen, shalom, and blessed be. I invite Jesse forward to offer our story for today. Good morning. Our story today is a flaming chalice story, circles of light. The flaming chalice is a symbol of our faith as Unitarian Universalists. It's a symbol of learning, caring, and love, of hope, and of freedom. Have you ever wondered how the chalice became a symbol of our faith? The reason comes from a time when Unitarians from America were trying to help people affected by a war that was happening in Europe. It was a fight against fascism, and many, many people were suffering. This is one story of one family during that time. Nicolette and her brother Jean-Pierre were cold and hungry, and when their, her, their mother heard that soldiers were coming, she and grandmother Lucy 
bundled up food, clothing, and blankets, and the four of them set off with other people who were escaping the town. They were refugees, people with no home, looking for a place to live until the war was over. After a week of traveling, all of their food was gone. It started to rain, and the road turned to mud, and everyone was scared. Suddenly, they heard a truck rumbling down the road, and Nicolette, Jean-Pierre, Mama, and Grandmère went to hide. When they peeked out between the branches, afraid that they would see soldiers, they saw a truck with a flaming chalice symbol on the side of it. Mama said, it's okay, I know these people, and I know they are here to help. You see, the Unitarian Service Committee knew that they needed a symbol that could tell other people, no matter the language they spoke, that they were here to help. And so the Unitarian Service Committee fed the people, took them to a building where it was warm and dry. And Nicolette and Jean-Pierre and Mama and Grandmère stayed there for four weeks until they could go to live with other family in a place that was safe. After the war was over, the Unitarians kept using that flaming chalice as a symbol and in worship. Later, when the Universalists joined the Unitarians, we made two circles that slightly overlapped. You might see it here on our hymnal. One circle is for the Unitarians and one for the Universalists. Those circles are close together because we are all connected to one another and to our world. The chalice isn't right in the middle. It's a little off to the side. It leaves room for other ways of understanding. There's always room for more in Unitarian Universalism. We, as Unitarian Universalists, have all kinds of chalices. We light one Sunday morning in worship. And at other times, some may even light a chalice at home for special occasions. Chalices come in lots of different shapes and sizes, just like Unitarian Universalists. I invite all of the children to join me as we head back to religious education. The financial health of this congregation is due to the generosity of our members and friends. We know that our financial contributions come from sacrifice and from work and effort. And we are so grateful for this. We commit together to ensure that the funds we collectively share do a greater good uh, in the world for ourselves and our world than they could have done alone. And so may there be an offering to sustain and grow the life and mission of this congregation. But we also, we also practice sharing the plate. About one-third of the undesignated funds we receive every Sunday uh, go to a local community group that is serving our area. And so for October, 
our Share the Plate recipient is Lula. Lula provides street support and peer advocacy for those experiencing housing and or food insecurity. This is a volunteer organization who works with uh, community partners such as Imago Day Church and Jolt Harm Reduction and Sophia's Kitchen. And a lot of the donations to Lula go to such basics as bottled water and tents for those who are outside, to hygiene products, to hand warmers for people to stay warm at night when it's cold, and to shelf-stable food. So Lula, in some ways, isn't actually all that visible on social media because they are, in fact, volunteers. This is whatever they do is in addition to their day jobs. And they also don't post that many photos of the people with whom they interact because out of respect for privacy. But they are there, and they keep working. And the small donations, any donations, go a long way. So for our Share the Plate uh, practice, two-thirds of the undesignated collection goes to the operating of the church. One-third goes to Lula this month. I invite you to use uh, our envelopes for to make your offering and indicate its use, or see the QR code in the order of service if you want to make an online donation. Thank you for all the gifts. It really makes a difference. And now, uh, I invite the ushers to please come forward. So if the mission of this congregation includes loving abundantly, embracing freedom, growing mind, body, and spirit, and being part of the healing of the world, then there are moments when we need to deal with difficult and even scary topics. What a great way to begin a sermon, right? Sure. But this is the case, and I want to offer that in this moment, as I was putting the pieces together, uh, what had been a reading and then the sermon is kind of a two-part sermon, in essence. So we'll be talking about the nature of fascism in this moment. We'll have a moment to breathe and sing, which is always a good choice. And then we'll have a second part of the message. There's been some really large words in our public discourse, and political discourse, and private conversations in the last many years, recent years in particular. Words such as totalitarian, authoritarian, fascism, nationalism. I want to take a moment to unpack a little bit of that in this part. So totalitarian is a system where 
those in power have all the control, absolute control over the people, over communications, over doing their best to control the thinking, over the politics, everything in a society. Because they think that's the best way that people should live. There's no room for differences of opinion. There's no room for individual expression. It's simply everything coming from the top down and people enforcing it. Authoritarian is similar, but there's a little bit, it's not quite so based in um, ideology. There's not a particular focus that a totalitarian system is trying to accomplish, uh, such as the purity of the race, for example. Authoritarian systems have, um, have a lot of top-down control, but there is a little bit of room for expression. There's a little bit of mobility. Um, I think one of the examples I received was uh, how things are structured in Cuba, for example. Now, fascism, one of the ways somebody described that as I was reading up, is it's a special blend of the worst of both. The worst of both, totalitarian and authoritarian. Where it's an approach that thinks that it also should be. It's ideologically driven and trying to make people conform to all the information that the leaders think should be the reality with very little room, if no room, for um, range or freedom of expression. Jason Stanley, the a professor and scholar of philosophy and propaganda at Yale. Can you imagine, think about that study work. I want to be a professor of propaganda. But this is serious. He is the author of How Fascism Works, the Politics of Us and Them. And he describes fascism as an ideology, but also, more importantly, as a political method. Unitarian Universalist minister, the Reverend Cecilia Kingman, offers a summary of Jason Stanley's thoughts on fascism in her 2023 Ferry Street Lecture, presented this past June to the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association. There are 10 tactics. I'm going to go through them very quickly. So I invite you to hang in there because she says they are intertwined. You've got to have them all. We can do this. So this is a combination of her words and his words in particular. The first tactic of fascism is that there is a mythic past. That there was once a glorious past and that we were once a great nation. And other people took away that greatness. It's a fairly simple narrative, right? We were great. Other people took away the great. We should be great again. Stanley says fascists are always telling a story about a glorious past that has been lost. And they tap into this nostalgia. So when you fight back against fascism, you have one hand tied behind your back because truth is messy and complex and the mythical story is always clear and compelling and entertaining. Entertaining. It's hard to undercut that story with facts. So mythic past. The second is propaganda. All groups use propaganda. We all do. Fascists use it in a way that defines friends and enemies. Others, others are a threat and dangerous. Anyone who is not a friend is other and they are dangerous. And that is the main point of the propaganda. The third tactic in fascism is anti-intellectualism. This has got to get the UUs going here. The leader determines what is true and false. The leader determines what is true and false. And multiple perspectives are a threat. 
multiple perspectives are a threat. So that's anti-intellectualism. This, no surprise, leads into the fourth tactic, which is unreality. Unreality in fascism is the destruction of notions of reality. Everyone lies, and the lies don't matter. Put a pause on that one there. You can't function as a democratic citizen if you are being lied to. Jason Stanley says, if you are going to rip the heart out of democracy, you get people used to lies. So that's the foundation of unreality, that tactic. The fifth tactic, and really at the core in the structure of fascism, is hierarchy. Hierarchy. It is setting classes and categories of people against each other, uh, and saying that only certain people are in power and everyone else is under them in various ways. And that leads directly to such hierarchies and, sense, and superior, structures of superiority as white supremacy, male supremacy, able-bodied supremacy, and so on. So hierarchy. These people are at the top and they are in control and everyone else is below. Now here's the trick. Hierarchy directly feeds into the, set, to the sixth tactic of fascism, which is victimhood. So victimhood is where once you have convinced people that they are justifiably higher in the hierarchy, then you can convince them that they are victims of equality. I'm going to say my poor brain was like, victims of equality, holy cow. Fascists tell people that equality is victimizing them by making them lose their rightful place in power. Hmm. The seventh tactic in fascism is law and order. The dominant group is inherently law and biding, pure, good, honest people. Law abiding also means loyalty to the dominant group. Law and order defines who is, is legitimate in the system and who is not. And it's ultimately reinforced by violence. Fascism scholar Ruth ben Giat reminds us that the essence of fascism is violence. The essence of this is to eliminate those who are not worthy and to preserve the system by eliminating those people. The eighth tactic in fascism is sexual anxiety. I gotta tell you, when I read this, I'm like, sexual anxiety? Wait, how is this? So this is where it shows up. In every case, Stanley was talking about and looking at everything he studied, every case, every cultural, every historic setting, the fascist leader will always say, your women and children are under threat. You need a strong man to protect your families. Sexual anxiety. You need a strong man to protect your women and children. So then that makes a whole lot more sense of why we're seeing such a massive rise in attacks against folks who are trans, right? It's right there. The ninth tactic is what Stanley calls Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the stereotyping of the rural-urban divide, and it's based in fear. So rural folks are portrayed as hardworking, good, honest people. When people speak of urban uh, folks, inner city folks, 
that becomes code for black, indigenous, people of color, immigrants, folks who are Jewish, addicts, violence, violent folks or anything like that. So there's this purity of world and then these urban dangerous people. That's Sodom and Gomorrah. The last tactic, the tenth, is what Stanley, who is a child of Holocaust survivors, what he calls uh, Arbit Macht Frey. Work will make you free. These words were hung over the gate at Auschwitz. Fascists create an idea that minorities, immigrants, and others are lazy, that these groups need to be taught a work ethic. And they will need to be taught by working and that labor is free. So it'll translate to, say, student protesters are lazy because they're not producing anything. They should be discounted because they don't work, for example. So let's ignore the student protesters. But it also means that people who can't work or work and be productive in ways that are defined by the leaders, those people are disposable. The elderly, the ill, those people are disposable. Work shall make you free. Those are the 10 tactics a fascism defined by Jason Stanley. Let's take a moment. I think if we're going to be talking about social concerns, how do we navigate this moment? We need to know what, this, what these are meaning, what is being done. So I want to invite us into a moment of pause and into a moment, think of it as a sung prayer, this hymn, number 159, this is my song. Because when we go into the next part of the sermon, it'll be, how do we understand this and what shall we do about it? Please rise and body your spirit and join me for number 159, this is my song.
Please be seated. It occurs to me as we are gathered in this moment, in worship together, in this as a congregation, in the day in, day out, as we gather, our children are gathered in the religious education wing. We are here because we care. We are here because we understand that the power of compassion, that the desire for justice and right relationship, that these are worthy ventures. We are here because of our values of generosity, of being connected with everything, of being connected across perspectives, that we have a pluralist approach to the world, that we care for ourselves and our neighbors, though our neighbors are certainly different than we are, that we respect the inherent worth and dignity of every person, knowing that we are fully flawed as well as human beings in this moment. We value information, science, truth. And we value a society where people have a say. We are stronger, we know, when we are connected, when we live out of compassion. What's also true is that we are vulnerable when we are separated and can't find the path to connection. Hannah Arendt, a German-American historian and political theorist of the 20th century, writes about totalitarianism, about connection, about context. In her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, that she addresses the circumstances of World War II, what led into it and what happened during it. She's particularly known for talking about the banality of evil and for explaining how ordinary people become actors in violent and terror-based and terror systems, in totalitarian systems, how any one of us can be a participant. And part of what she does is to look at the heart of where does that come from in our human experience. And she makes a case for how loneliness, just the simple presence of loneliness, the experience of that, can leave us vulnerable. Samantha Rose Hill explores Arendt and loneliness and its impact in the article where loneliness can lead. Arendt distinguishes between isolation and loneliness. She says, isolation and loneliness are not the same. I can be isolated, that is, being in a situation in which I cannot act because there is nobody who will act with me. There's no interchange. And I can be in that place of isolation without being lonely. And she says, I can be lonely. That is, in a situation in which I, as a person, feel myself deserted by all human companionship. I can be lonely without being isolated. You can be lonely in the crowd of people for example. Samantha Rose Hill says, totalitarianism uses isolation to deprive people of human companionship, making action in the world impossible, while destroying the space of solitude. So you're in a place where you can't act and that destroys the option of solitude. The iron band of totalitarianism, as Arendt calls it, destroys a person's ability 
to move, to act, to think, while turning each individual in their loneliness against all others, including themselves. So loneliness is when you're turned against all others, including yourselves in this totalitarian system. You can't move. There's no place to go. And you even can't connect with yourself. So then the world, all existence, becomes a wilderness where neither experience or thinking are possible. So in our early 20th century, we had conditions that were ready to turn that experience, that totalitarian effort, into a place of wilderness. Where a few individuals and other leaders, or a few individuals saw the opportunity and acted, and a few leaders were unable to set a boundary. So following the Great War, World War I, the treaty that followed, the Treaty of Versailles, it stripped Germany of resources and its ability to function fulfill its financial obligations, or support its people. I mean, there are consequences for participating in a world war. And what also came as a result fed a deep anger and hopelessness. This was the case in Germany. This was the case in Italy. And so people there sought solutions, like turning to a strong leader with wide authority and great power and rule. That mythic past was the narrative. We were great, and now we suffer because of others. How shall we be great again? We shall do it by defeating the other. And the method was control, complete, specific, violent, not based on truth or science, but emotional connection with the leader, not family even, with emotional connection with the leader. The foundation of fascism, says Thought Co., is a combination of ultra-nationalism, the extreme devotion to one's nation over all others, along with a widely held belief among the people that the nation must and will somehow be saved or reborn. So rather than working for concrete solutions to economic, political, and social problems, like actually getting in and getting the work done, the fascist rulers divert people's focus and win public support and elevate the need for a national rebirth and a virtual religion, in essence. The nation is the faith. And to this end, the fascists encourage the growth of cults of national purity, national unity, and in this case, in pre-World War II Europe, those movements were going for the idea that non-Europeans were genetically inferior. And we must make those who are genetically superior right. We must make them better and stronger and have the national pure race. And these folks leading into the wars were setting up the setting the stage by destabilizing moments, by destabilizing the government, by destabilizing the people. People couldn't rely on the government, in essence. They must need a new leader. So here again is the mythic narrative of the great past taken away by other less worthy people. Those of us who were so put upon are now victims, and we must become strong again. I don't know. Sounds a little familiar. Sounds a little, dare I say, current. And what Arendt also points out is that whether or not you have totalitarian um, societies actually enacting, you know, groups actually practicing, it's now in the system. It's now in our mindset as, as human beings, we know what this looks like. And people, will, it's more likely to be perpetuated and more likely to be appealing by those who want this power. 
So now we all have to figure out the path. And that includes even folks who are not going along with the ideology of where a, a fascist or totalitarian system might be, but those who might be tempted by the, the methods. Because people all over the place, including Unitarian Universalists, have this habit of glorifying and romanticizing the past. And sometimes out of religious trauma from the past, might think that liberal religion is, you know, because we are more clear thinkers. We are more rational than everyone else, so we must be better. I can't tell you how long I have heard that thread as in someone who's grown up Unitarian Universalist. We have our own work to do in being mindful of these methods and tactics that are destructive to all of us. We have to be able, for example, to tell complex and painful truths about white Protestant history and including Unitarian Universalism. And the painful truth of our history, there's a, I'll give a, an example, the congregation in uh, uh, Needham, Massachusetts. What they're working on in particular is the fact that at least one of the ministers in the past, one of the people who served that congregation, also enslaved people. Complicated, right? Minister, white male minister, enslaved African Americans. And that's part of the history, and that's real. So we need to be able, in whatever our context, that's why we're not just talking about fascism as like this thing out there, these people across the river, these people across the country, people in Washington and wherever or around the world. It's not just out there. It's what we also have to be mindful of for ourselves as we struggle to address racial and ethnic diversity and our own participation in white supremacy. What we can do, what we can do is keep practicing what is of worth to us, of what we say we value and hold true. My colleague Cecilia Kingman, I love the way she starts this moment. She's like, truth is real and facts are facts. Let's not forget it. We like science. Let's keep like, liking science. And let's study and let's talk. And let's keep building relationship with one another, including the chance to build relationship and address complicated history that might address generational cycles of harm. We continue to affirm inherent worth of every person because no one is disposable. Can I get an amen? No one is disposable, right? Let's start there. And that we are spectacularly diverse. Learning about fascism is a way to put love into action. Not avoid difficult conversations, not avoid and just hope for the best. We need to protect what is under attack, the institutions that do foster, welcome, and range and multiple perspectives. Not to restore them to a previous time, but what those institutions do now and for the future, for our education, for our collective exploration and relationship, we keep practicing, we keep loving. We might, in fact, feel lonely that there is no way we can move and change, but then let's come back together again and say, ah, we can move and change together. 
This is one, but one moment. As we're gathering in service today, this is just one moment. This is one conversation. And I will guarantee as soon as you leave the space and check your phone, there's going to be something new to spike your adrenaline and add to the fear of the world. I mean, really, right? But we don't have to be so hijacked. At least not forever. It might take a minute. We get to remember, if nothing else, how beautiful and powerful you are and we are. Because we are glorious and tenacious and enjoy and enduring and joyful and fully human and part of this world. We are. Amen. Please rise, embody your spirit, and join me for our closing hymn, number 131, Love Will Guide Us. What other hymn could we sing? Sending our light into the world, senders of light anonymous. Knowing how quickly the flame of truth may be extinguished, how easily the chalice of fellowship is broken, let us be vigilant in faith, keep peace in our hearts, and make care for one another. The watchword of our lives together, so our light goes out everywhere into the world. Amen. Oh, oh. Good morning. Good morning.